Hello everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, today we have uh, another special guest from Massachusetts, United States. And he, Unjang, Unsang, <laughs> it's his name that he adopted in the, in the same tradition where he is uh, right now working in this spiritual path. And he's uh, going to explain us um, what it is this tradition, how was his work, and other questions that we have for him, and then we elaborate. Uh, so thank you all again for being here. And can you please introduce yourself for our public? Sure. Um, my name is Myung Jin. Unsan, uh, everyone just calls me Unsan though, so that makes things simpler. Um, I'm a Zen Buddhist uh, priest. Um, I have a Sangha uh, in Western Massachusetts. It's called One Mind Zen. And a Sangha is uh, just a community of practitioners. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I uh, just recently was given uh, Dharma transmission from my teacher uh, back in June. Uh, before that, um, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, I was ordained as a priest. And uh, I've been practicing Zen in general uh, with a number of different groups since um, the early 2000s. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, can you explain us what is this um, tradition, yes, Zen tradition? Um, for the... Okay. For the ones over there. Mm -hmm. So, Zen uh, is a form of Buddhism, first of all. Um, Zen as it's practiced uh, now started in China about 1500 years ago or thereabouts. Uh, the first um, Zen patriarch uh, in China, basically the founder of Zen in China, was named Bodhidharma, and he came from India uh, into China uh, to bring the practice of uh, Zen Buddhism there. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> all the different branches of Zen all trace our origin back to Bodhidharma. Uh, the particular tradition that uh, my practice is, is a Korean-based uh, practice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, we're in the lineage of uh, Zen master Sung San, and lineage means that basically teacher to teacher to teacher to student to teacher to student. Okay. You know. okay. So uh, Sung San would be my... Uh, great grand teacher or grand teacher i don't know he's a few generations back okay but he came came from korea to uh the united states and uh started what's called the providence zen center and um the order involved with that the kwanum school has branches worldwide, Poland, uh, United States, Germany, all over. And um, so we're in Sung San's lineage, uh, which as I said, is a Korean based uh, form of practice. Uh, I don't know if I am confused, but I have this like, I always like say, I am Zen, you know, but I, of course I didn't follow anything like this, but I say I am Zen because I just, have two pants in my closet, two pair of shoes, 
and I don't have so many things in my house, you know. And <laughs> so, <laughs> is this uh, something that is uh, connected with Zen or not? To be simple in your life and not to have uh, so many things in your closet and in your daily life? That's going to, to vary. Um, one of the main things about Buddhism, going back to the Buddha himself, basically his first teaching was of the middle path, which means, well, in his case, he had been born into luxury and he was searching for a solution to what he perceived to be the problem with human existence. So he went from luxury to the point where he was an ascetic, where he almost starved himself to death. Mm -hmm. And he realized that nowhere between luxury and poverty was the answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the middle path he found was to go to neither extreme, uh, to stay in the middle of the road and not fall off onto a ditch on one side of the road or the other. So are there practitioners who have very little? Yes. Are there practitioners who have uh, a lot? I suppose. Probably. Okay. I don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> but there probably are. Um <laughs> So it's it's a matter of not attaching to the things that you do have mm -hmm. and not uh, craving what you don't have. Okay, yes. If you only have two pairs of shoes and you really want a third pair of shoes, that's part of the, the problem of the human condition if okay. you've got 50 pairs of shoes and you want that 51st pair that's also part of the problem okay so it's like if i have like uh, these two pairs of shoes and i don't have a problem to give away one of my pairs of shoes yes or i don't need more shoes i will be okay yes i will be in on the way I, I would mm -hmm. say yes, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also it's not a problem to have a lot of things just if you don't attach with that. Yes, it's like um ah yeah, it's uh, very <laughs> yeah. So okay, so you have a you have a school, yes. So Zen Zen tradition have different schools, like I understand, yes. Mm -hmm. So your school, um, it, what is the difference of your school and what is the aim? Uh, what do you um, specialize on? I mean, do you have certain exercise, certain way of uh, uh, like dressing? Uh, uh, um, everybody is vegetarian or not? Um, all these kind of things. Uh, uh -huh. Um. Well, like I said, all Zen practitioners trace back to Bodhidharma mm -hmm. in, in China. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, as it spread from China to Korea, to Japan, to Vietnam, and to the U.S., things have changed, um, you know, across time. In fact, one of the uh, sanghas in, uh, in my order is in Guadalajara. Oh, nice. <laughs> I like Jalisco. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, there are Zen practitioners all over the globe. Mm -hmm. Like I said, uh, we're in a, uh, a Korean order, which means that, you know, we wear gray robes and, and brown casas and... <clears throat> um, you know, in Japanese forms, they'll wear uh, black or blue. Okay. Uh, their casas will mean different things uh, in different schools. 
um, Chan, which is how Zen is pronounced in China. Uh, Chan practitioners will have different style robes. Um, all forms of Zen, however, are going to uh, start with meditation as a uh, focus of the practice. So we do seated meditation, walking meditation, but we also uh, try and take our meditative practice when we're sitting and we're standing and we're lying down. We try and bring our, our practice with us wherever we go. Mm -hmm. In in my particular order, what we emphasize is uh, what well, we put it as only don't know and how may I help you? Okay. In Zen, <clears throat> there's something called the Maha, the in Mahayana Buddhism in general, which is sort of a broad blanket term for a whole lot of different schools. Uh, and in Zen in particular, we uh, recite the Bodhisattva vows uh, every week, every time we meet. And a Bodhisattva is a person who uh, has vowed to not enter Nirvana themselves until all other beings have entered Nirvana. Okay, which mm -hmm. you know is is somewhat you know. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yes. So until maybe um, you will say until you are Catholic until Lucifer don't go to awake again, don't go back to paradise, then you don't go away. Um. Yeah. It's you know the the Bodhisattva the first. Bodhisattva vow is sentient beings are numberless. We vow to help them all. And very simply, you know, that, that sounds like really big and, and huge and yes. totally impossible. Yes, because, I mean, you include the demons there, yes, or not? I mean, the, the, the bad energies, the bad influence, the, or not? Would say that again? Yeah, I mean, like uh, Bodhisattva includes the the demons. I mean, is the demons there, like the, the bad people? So he wants also well, them to awake and then to to go into Nirvana. Right. I wouldn't necessarily. They would qualify as Bodhisattvas, but uh, demons or generally nasty people would be considered sentient beings. So we have to try and help not only the people that we like, and not only the people that look like us, but the ones we don't particularly like. You know, mm -hmm. those, the people in the other political parties and the people in other countries and, uh, your next your next door neighbor who has a dog that won't stop barking um uh, mm -hmm. they're all sentient beings and the bodhisattva's uh goal uh is to help them all so now i mean the question is how When somebody is carrying a big, heavy bag of groceries and they need to get on the elevator and they, they can't quite push the button themselves because they'll spill the groceries everywhere. You're standing next to them. You push the button for them. Even if you don't need to get onto the elevator yourself. Okay. You know, somebody... Uh, needs a, sh a shopping cart that you know like an old, old lady who can't quite get there you get it for them um kid needs help with homework you know 
almost anything, anytime we come in contact with another person, we have the opportunity to help them. We may not know exactly what that is yet, um, but it's an opportunity nonetheless. Okay, so here is, sorry, I didn't write this in the question, right? <laughs> uh, so how do you, I mean, I used to be in a four-way school that our teacher used to say, we meditate when we eat, we have exercise, yes, yeah, like you just eat. When you mm -hmm. speak, you just speak and things like that. But he say, if you go and help other person, people, I mean, we Jeff just to say this also, sometimes you forget about yourself. And that is not so good always, because then you are not present to your own, yes, to your own energy. And it is very important also to be present in that moment. So to not always can be there for everybody. How do you, I mean, how do you solve this, <laughs> this problem in your everyday life? Um, you're talking about compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue. Um, uh, again, uh, it's the middle path, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. If you can't, you know, give away all of your money uh, because someone, you know, down the street has nothing to eat and you give them all your money, well then, you know, I and, you know, my family, my children, whoever it might be, then will be starving, <laughs> Just, right? You're so right. It's, it's the middle path of where you can help somebody and should help somebody, but not to the point where um, you're hurting yourself also. So okay. we have to remember that all sentient beings includes me. <laughs> so <Nice. laughs> um, when I'm helping you, I'm helping myself. When I'm helping myself, I'm helping you. So like I said, middle path. Beautiful. Thank you. So, uh, what is a tool that you use to do meditation? I mean, if you um, I I want to say no, <laughs> that there aren't any, um, and I could say yes. There's a cushion that we sit on. Um, okay. but that's, that's the point of Zen is to, um, find our, our true nature, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the main things that we do in order to do that is to meditate. Um, like I said, that doesn't mean just you know, sitting on a meditation cushion and then, you know, the other 23 hours a day, you're the same less than wonderful person <laughs> <laughs> that yes, came in exactly. and sat on the cushion. It's, it's easy to be real peaceful and calm and all that when you're sitting on a cushion in a sort of dark room and everybody's quiet. Mm -hmm. Right, that's that's pretty easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, when you're not on the cushion, though, can you still maintain that uh, mental peace in order to focus on things like helping other beings, uh, to focus on, you know, eating when eating? Uh, <laughs> driving when driving mm -hmm. you know doing doing that one thing uh very specifically very intently 
Um, one of Sung San's sayings was, just do it. And yeah. by that, he means like you were saying, you know, when eating, focus on eating. Uh, when driving, focus on driving. You know, it, uh, it all becomes a form of meditation. Yeah, our, our, our teacher just to, to give us an exercise and it's another tool uh, that we call it uh, voluntary suffering. Uh, sometimes say, sometimes when we walk, we forget that we are walking. So we need a little bit another push. So you put a little stone in your in your in your foot in your shoe, shoes. So the stone will remind you. <laughs> will remind you, but it's just very little. Then you you take it away because you don't want to make like as uh, a lot of suffering there. Yes. So just a little. Right. A little suffering because you to get you go there to it's very easy in the inertia that you that you down yes I don't I don't know about your <laughs> your um, everyday if if that works for you great yeah uh, well yeah sometimes right now I don't use it so much but yeah for, I don't yes. There's there's a, a fine line between being mindful and um, just doing it, as Sung San would say. Both of them, you're basically focused on the same thing. Like if it's walking meditation, you're very consciously walking, right? Right. Um, however, there's also the point at which when you're doing walking meditation, you don't necessarily have to think about walking meditation. You just walk and you stay in that meditative frame of mind and you don't have to think about putting one foot next to the other, next to the other. It just comes naturally. And that's one of the, the big things that we try and focus on is, like I said, our true nature, right? What do we do that doesn't require thought okay like i said you can start out by really focusing on i'm putting this foot and this foot and this foot and this foot and then eventually it becomes natural and you just do it which is great when you're doing walking meditation but let's say you're standing on a street corner and a little kid is going to run out into traffic and maybe get hit by a car. Now, if you're really mindful and you're present and all that stuff, the thing you might fall into is, oh, I'm noticing this child is running into traffic. Oh, I'm noticing that they might get hit by a car. And you have all this thinking going on. And meanwhile, the yeah. kid gets hit by a car. Okay. True nature, don't know mind, mm -hmm. is doing it without even having to think about it. All right. Kid yes. is running into traffic. You snatch the kid and, and keep her from getting hit by a car without even having to think about it. Okay. Um, so many times when I read about Zen, I read also about Koan. I don't know if I know uh -huh. Koan. And it's this kind of problems that are like, like 
you almost cannot solve it, you know, it's so difficult. Like, how do you take out the the chicken from a bottle without to break the bottle and kill the chicken or something like that? Yeah, it's like, oh God, you know, and I was like, always like, oh yes, I have my stick, magic stick, and then I, I <laughs> just make it. <them. laughs> but, um, so. That's it, you use the magic stick. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And I convert the chicken into something else. <laughs> okay. So how do you these problems are for what? To train the mind, to to stay it's just when you are sitting in meditation. Um, why is this problem or why they exist? Um why do they exist? And do they exist? That's that's a fine question. The okay, in different schools of Zen, there there are, um, as you said, different tools or different methods mm -hmm. to try and get to that point where you you know see your true nature, right? In a number of different schools, mine included, we use gongans, and like you said, there seemingly ridiculous questions or situations and so what's the sound of one hand yeah. <laughs> uh, the the point of them is that you don't try and solve them you don't try and figure out a way to get the chicken out of the bottle. Okay. Um, it's it's a way again to get past the conceptual thought that that trips us up so often. You know, okay. it's like if you try and logically solve what is the hand the sound of one hand, you know. You could go with that forever. <laughs> yes. Not really figure out logically what the sound of one hand is. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, look at it, um, you know, in that before thought stage, um, or um, like I said, just, just, getting rid of the conceptual thought and, and desire for logic and, and desire to solve this thing, you realize intuitively what the answer is. And, and let me just say one thing here. Other than the magic stick and the chicken in the bottle, <laughs> um, Kongans are to be practiced between a teacher and a student. And, um, you know, people who talk about them outside of that relationship um, aren't really doing anyone a service. Oh, okay. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. I have students that I work on Kongans with that on one day they'll give me an answer and it'll be good. I'll, I'll approve. On another day, they may give me the same answer and maybe on that day, it's not so good. It okay. depends on, on a lot of factors, mm -hmm. but regardless, it's, the kind of thing that you know student and teacher in a you know private meeting work on kongans you know uh, the books that have you know kongans and discussions of them and all that stuff it's just like uh, yeah intellectual and mind and it's just <laughs> exactly okay. it's all intellectual it's all you know logical thinking it's like totally not the point <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you for all of this. Uh, so, why uh, to focus in 
don't know. Yes, that you were telling me that. Uh... Don't know is um, in Korean Zen, uh, what in other schools might be called um, beginner's mind. Um, it might be called uh, no mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's all that same reference back to the primary point before all the thinking comes into play. It's not, I don't know. It's not ignorance of a fact. Like, you know, I don't know how a uh, jet engine works because I really don't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's not that kind of don't know. It's the um, lack of attachment to facts or ego or um, any number of other things that refer back to I, I, I. Mm -hmm. I know this, I know that, I can do this, I can do that. No, that's, that's totally not where uh, our attitude should be coming from. It should be we. We, we can do this. We are, um, okay. Yeah. As you can see on my, my name thing, uh, it says we, us, our. We, us, our, yes. So this read is, that? Yes, I saw it. So it's, this is like, the computer is not mine, it's our computer. Yes, I mean... This body is not really mine, it's our, it's like, yeah, it's more focusing that precious, like, no, it's, yeah, the context of. In, in Zen, we have a, a phrase that's not one, not two. No one, not two, okay. <laughs> All right, like, obviously, I'm not in Mexico and you're not in Massachusetts. Exactly. And I'm going to do whatever it is I'm going to do next. And you're going to do whatever it is you do next. And I'm going to go to sleep in my bed tonight and you'll go to sleep in yours. And however, the whole universe is doing whatever they're going to be doing next. Mm -hmm. The whole universe is sleeping in their beds. The whole universe is going to eat the next meal, right? There's there's no, you know, chopping up into uh, I, 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 when in reality, it's we, we, we. Okay. Yeah, I, I catch it. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, the, the whole humanity needs water and is drinking water. Yes, it's breathing. Yes, it's uh, yeah, walking, you know, moving, you know, this kind of thing is communicating mm -hmm. in one way. Okay, nice. Um, uh, what is, uh, why to be sane? Well, uh, how can change our society? and everyday life. You don't need Zen to change, you know, everyday life or society. Um, people just uh, need to see their true nature. And if Zen is the way that they get to that point, wonderful. If they can do that by intuitively knowing to pull the kid back away from incoming traffic, then you don't need Zen. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, Zen is a way to develop that because most people probably don't 
act in that intuitive uh, doing the right thing all the time. So Zen practice can help with that, but um, it's not a requirement. And in fact, there are some people who would probably do really badly with Zen because some people, you know, if you're sitting in a dark room for a half hour, there, there are people that have different mental problems or, or physical problems or whatever, and it may actually be very harmful for them. Mm -hmm. So if you can sit Zen, wonderful. If you can't sit Zen, wonderful. Right. Do you know, I, I remember a movie that was very famous. So this movie was like, um, I think a spring, summer, winter, something like this. Oh, uh-huh. Yes, very beautiful. I love it. But at the end, the disciple was, <laughs> I mean, he went out of the temple and he didn't know how to act. Yes, how to act, act Zen with, with her wife <sighs> and with uh, everything. So it's very, I mean, it's sad. It's really sad to see that. And then he had to work with himself more, I mean, a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. How can you explain this, I mean, behavior? I mean, I know that maybe it was his traumas. He had a traumas when he was a child, you know. I mean... It's not that Zen is going to direct you there, yes? <laughs> it's that right. he has certain, I don't know, certain things that he didn't work with. Well, everything is always changing, changing, changing from moment to moment to moment, right? Mm -hmm. So even though he left the temple and he was really different from everyone else, and acted differently and looked different and you know everything was different that doesn't mean that he was just going to stay that way mm -hmm. right you learn you change you adapt you know you uh <clears throat> You may not know what an elevator is when you're in the temple, but then you see somebody who can't push the button and you push the button for them. Even if you have no idea what that thing is that goes up, you know that they're trying to push it with their elbow and their nose and all <laughs> that. So you, you help them. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, the the monk that you're talking about in that movie, and that is a great movie. Uh, <laughs> um, he's going to be changing and everyone else everywhere all the time, everybody changes. So maybe he'll have an effect on everyone he comes in contact with. Maybe on the other hand, maybe somebody will have a less than wholesome effect on him. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Changing, changing, changing. I observe also a lot that uh, many times when uh, I go to a meditation or Zen meditation, or I go to see a painting from a Zen artist, uh -huh. I observe that they focus on the emptiness. And so why is good to look for emptiness and focus on emptiness? Well, in, in art, a lot of it has to do with the, the white space, right? Mm -hmm. Where there is, you know, in between lines or, or wherever. And um, that's one kind of emptiness. There's another kind of emptiness also, but... Uh, in in music do you play music at all yes yes i did um <laughs> intervals okay. so you know when when songs are written out 
you know, you have your eighth notes and mm -hmm. then you have quarter notes and so on and so forth. And there is a space in between one note and the next. Sometimes you even have rests where, you know, for a bar, you're, you're not playing, mm -hmm. right? If it weren't for those spaces in between the notes, everything would always be on all the time. It would always be noise. Same thing if you're, if you're typing and you don't use spaces in between the words, everything becomes uncompre incomprehensible. Yes. Um, you're speaking and you never take a breath in between words and you keep talking like this, <laughs> then maybe can, no one understands you, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that space in between the lines of a painting or in between the notes or in between the words helps give uh, each of them meaning, something that, that we can, you know, understand. Um, the other kind of emptiness, I don't know if you want to go into that or not, but uh, that that's getting into things that are a little heavier that might take kind of a while to explain. Uh, yes, sure. I mean, I, well, I, I would love this okay. connection with emptiness. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So in Sanskrit, the word is shunyata. And that refers to... Um, things that are subject to causes and conditions, okay? Things that are impermanent, things that, you know, they're going to change, right? Mm -hmm. um, as, as quickly as I can, anything that's subject to causes and conditions that's subject to impermanence, the fact that everything is, is always changing, uh, that has no self nature, uh, that is, those things are, are referred to as uh, characterized by emptiness, shunyata, okay? If you take a chair, and you take one of the legs off. Is that still a chair? <laughs> is that still a chair leg, or is it something that you could, you know, use in a fireplace? <laughs> yes. There's, there's no chair nature to that chair that says this is a chair. Period. Exactly. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So change one little thing, and something goes from. Oh, this is a chair to not so much chair anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I pronounce it well. The next uh, word, what is um, skandas? Skandas. That that's um, one of the oldest uh, Buddhist teachings. Um, the five skandas are form, feeling, perception, impulses, and consciousness, and uh, first of all, let me say that in the Heart Sutra, the opening line is Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when practicing deeply, the Prajna Paramita perceives all five skandhas are empty, and so on. So, first of all, the skandhas, they're characterized by emptiness. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, before we start treating them like they're real or have some sort of self nature to them so form is you know the physical aspect of something uh 
feeling is the sensory percept sensory um impact that something has i'm looking mm -hmm. at this thing and it has these two little boxes on it and then the the perception is that oh there are these things there and i'm trying to make sense out of them and i'm calling them boxes and uh impulse is where they all come together and i start having uh start giving things names like oh that's my laptop and mm -hmm. that's Claudia in that little box over there and oh there's me in this little box <laughs> over here mm -hmm. and um consciousness is just our base of experience where mm -hmm. all the skandhas come into play and like i said form feeling perception impulse consciousness all empty no self nature no intris intrinsic formness to the form no feelingness to the feeling okay mm -hmm. they're they're basically the collection of things that people think constitute them some people you know maybe you could call it uh personality or um the way they deal with the external world okay all right so i know that you have um different kind of exercise and do practice every day or or maybe with other people a group that you say in internet in zoom a channel maybe so do you wish to invite our public to i mean they can come to to your meditations oh. and these kind of things and um, when they are uh, i mean i mean do they have to give any donation and um, yeah this kind of Thanks. Yeah, if um, if anyone wanted to uh, join in one of our meditation uh, sessions, they're certainly welcome to. Um, you know, if you look up One Mind Zen, mm -hmm. um, you'll probably find either the Facebook page or the website or whatever. And that has a um, a link to our uh, weekly Zoom meditation. We have one Monday morning at 6.30 uh, Eastern time. And we have another one on, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Nice. And if people want to join in via Zoom, great um if they want to just look at it uh on their own they can watch the youtube channel right okay. One Mind zen youtube channel you can mm -hmm. see you know what a whole uh meditation session is they're about an hour long and um we also have the the dharma talks which are usually 10 to 20 minutes or so somebody giving a, a teaching about uh, Zen practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So which uh, kind of books do you recommend for our public uh, in this kind of practice? Uh, okay, so get your, get your pencil ready. <laughs> yes. Um, I think the the first one would be um, what the Buddha taught by Walhola, uh, yeah, Walhola. Um, that you know goes back and that goes through each of the uh, individual teachings of the Buddha, mm -hmm. you know, okay. from the beginning, from uh, more of a Zen standpoint 
uh, Sung San's Dropping Ashes on the Buddha is a good one. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by uh, Suzuki Roshi is yeah, nice. another one. Um, uh, let's see what else. Mirror of Zen is a good one. Okay. Uh, you don't have to like read it front to back. You can just read little pieces <laughs> and and get something out of it. Um, there's another one uh, that's going to be out soon called Yes But. Yes which, But. Yes, and that's that's going to be coming out soon. Um, and then um, just in general. Uh, Find a copy of the Diamond Sutra, the Heart Sutra, and um, the Platform Sutra. And that's pretty good foundation of um, Zen, Zen teaching. Okay, beautiful. Uh, thank you. So do you wish uh, to tell us something else for our public that I didn't cover in this? Um, no, just, you know, how may I help you? <laughs> okay. So thank you very much um, for this unsang. Yes, unsang. I <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, so to our public, uh, please uh, subscribe and also go to look for the channel. I want to post the link down in the comments okay. that you can find it very easy. Great. And um, so I hope to see you in one of the meditations. I hope to have <laughs> Yes. Thank you. See you some Wednesday. See you.